famous foreign artists of the last 500 years spent time working in Britain. A new exhibition at London's Tate Britain explores how migration has shaped the course of British art, bringing fresh perspectives from an outsider's eye. But with the high cost of living and a globalised market, is the attraction to this country still as strong? Here's our culture editor, Matthew Kane. Just what do migrant workers contribute to the UK? This week, Art Gallery Tate Britain is asking the same question being raised by the government, ahead of the publication of its new immigration policy. This new exhibition explores how British art has been shaped by the impact of migrant artists. We're an island nation and it's really easy to think of ourselves as being a homogenised culture that was suddenly invaded by um, people from elsewhere in the 20th century. But of course this has been happening for many years, many centuries beforehand. The exhibition explores the influence of avant-garde artists like Mondrian, who came to Britain to escape Nazi persecution during the Second World War. And it reveals a surprising fact about the landscape. Well, in fact, the exhibition's arguing that it was a genre that was imported by artists from Northern Europe, um, Sibirex, Kyrinx, Griffier. Um, at the time, portrait painting was really the only genre happening in Britain and something you consider to be a quintessentially British genre was in fact imported from the continent. Zineb Sadira is an artist who works in photography and video. She came to Britain from France in 1986. For me, what attracted me here, it's the kind of the openness towards uh, identity or cultural identity and the diversity. And also perhaps when I was in, in, in the UK or in London, I wasn't an Algerian anymore, a daughter of an Algerian, but I was, you know, an artist, you know, a person, full stop. So I think that's what attracted me, that kind of difference with France, you know, in, in relation to kind of race issue or ethnic issues. But looking ahead to the future, many people in the art world now believe that the migration of artists into Britain is slowing down. And that as a result, the nature of this dialogue between British art and external influences could be changing. Over the last decade, many of the best-known British artists, such as Tacita Dean and Douglas Gordon, have now left the UK to work in cities like Berlin. It's a trend which has been noted by students and staff at the Royal College of Art. There's a lot of um, cheap uh, rental, uh, both studio space and, and residential accommodation. And, you know, artists love to flock to those kind of areas, whether it's Red Hook in Brooklyn or whether it's, you know, East Berlin in, in, in Germany. I think there's always that kind of gravitational pull. Um, used to be Hackney, Shoreditch in London. That, that of course, has now uh, disappeared because it's become far too expensive for most artists. But, of course, this doesn't mean that the interchange of ideas between British and foreign artists has slowed down. In an increasingly globalised art market, and with international communication now easier than ever, British art continues to be shaped by foreign influences. The exhibition at Tate Britain ends with this film by Steve McQueen. He lives in Amsterdam, has galleries in London, Paris and New York, and exhibits around the world. Perhaps challenging our very understanding of what it means to be a British artist. Matthew Kane, well, tonight's main news, the first new figure since the decision to treble tuition fees show the number of people applying to UK universities has fallen by 9%. Don't forget, full weather forecast to follow with Liam Dutton, and you can follow us on Twitter. And, of course, the news continues online, channel4.com forward slash news. We're back tomorrow, 7 o'clock. Until then, from Krishnan and from me, that's Channel 4 News. Good evening. Good evening. There's set to be a big change in how the weather feels for all of us this week. It's set to be very cold. Temperatures barely above freezing by day as the week goes on. And some hard frosts by night. Temperatures widely down to minus 5 
or below. Here's the reason why. You can see from the blues and the pinks, some very cold air at the moment across eastern parts of Europe. And it's being fed westwards towards the UK and it will persist right through the forthcoming week. Now, through this evening and overnight, it's a fairly quiet story across the UK. Still some rain and hill snow affecting Wales and southwestern parts of England. Some snow showers too affecting eastern parts of Scotland and England. Maybe a light dusting in places, but not amounting to much. For the rest of us, dry with clear skies and it will be cold. A widespread frost, the risk of icy patches too, as temperatures fall down to minus two or minus three. So a cold, frosty and ugly icy start to Tuesday morning. The last of the rain, sleet and hill snow eases away from southwestern parts of England. Morning snow flurries fade away from eastern parts of England and Scotland. Otherwise, it's dry. There'll be lengthy spells of sunshine, but feeling cold, particularly in the breeze across southern parts of the UK, highs of two to four degrees. Another frosty night on Tuesday night, and then for northern parts of the UK, for Wednesday into Thursday, plenty of sunshine, just one or two snow showers affecting eastern parts of Scotland, highs of three or four degrees. Then for southern parts of the UK, Plenty of sunshine for Wednesday into Thursday, but feeling very cold, particularly in the easterly breeze. More about the cold snap on my blog at channel4.com forward slash weather. You can, of course, always join me on Twitter. Well, that's it from me. Enjoy your evening. Take care. Goodbye.